And I want to give my, my sincere appreciation for those of you that are coming faithfully on Sunday night. Um, I appreciate it, and I, I know that you're getting know, to know me a little better, and I'm getting to know you a little better, partly by your coming and then visits before and after. And uh, we certainly appreciate every, every person that makes the priority to come on Sunday night and to just make this a part of your Sunday routine. Um, you know how it is. If you, if you do something for 42 days in a row, they say you can form a habit or break a habit. Uh, but some habits are good. And I think Sunday night uh, teaching session is one of the good ones. And uh, we'll, we'll just do it for 42 and, and see how that goes. And then it, then it becomes part of you. But I, I appreciate you coming. I really do. And trust that you have... Um, some takeaway personal application from each session, from each ses session, not just the whole bundle of them together, but every single time we meet, I want you to take something away that changes you, that has changed your schedule, your priority, your awareness, your spiritual level. Something in your life has been altered. Um, I've been in church much of my life, um, and boring church is just not very high on my priority list. I, I want something to happen. I don't. I know better than to try to force anything, but I always ask myself the question: Did you receive a blessing of something, say, in in a spiritual sense, or did you learn something? And if neither of those two things happen, I'm not happy with what, <laughs> what went on. I need to receive something. Um, not everything seems like a blessing at the first, you know, but God intends good things to come to your life. Uh, but then learning about the one who has uh, done so much for us um, through Jesus Christ. So... Uh, that's my thank you for you being here tonight. The background of Nehemiah chapter 6, and I looked over my notes, and I want to apologize to you. I don't know when I've ever done that before. I skipped a whole section of uh, notes last week, and I, uh, I feel badly about that because um, I wanted to make some points, but I had some other things that were really rolling that I felt I needed to get to, and unintentionally I skipped a section there on page 1, and thank you for your tolerance. But, uh, and then we, we mentioned last week that we'll entertain some questions at the end of tonight's session. We'll start doing that if, if you want. And so don't just think up something. Uh, but if you have a real point that I didn't make clear or there's some connection that you want, um, but just don't think up questions to make me feel better, okay? Uh, real questions, all right? Good. We've seen that Nehemiah has been God's leader moving step by step through um, perseverance and sensitivity through the project that God has laid before him, or we'll use the, the, the churchy term, the, the burden that God has placed on his heart. And, and I think most of you or all of you understand that. God puts a burden on you, and it isn't hard to carry uh, in, in the laborious terms, but it's something that rises to the top of your priority list and you have to personally get involved in prayer and activity and giving and whatever else is necessary to accomplish what God has caused you to be aware of. And he, he, all he did was make Nehemiah aware and he moved on him uh, in, in a very strong way um, and then Nehemiah began to walk in that path. But, and, and I want you to take, take note of this for your own life. And I, again, I'll mention that I think these, um, the lessons in this series, and we've just got a couple left, um, I think are very timely for this church and, and you as individuals. I, I just believe um, in an unusual way, this is a very timely um, set of lessons. So I, I want you to hear this one clearly that Nehemiah, and I'm, I'm 
speaking to you, not just about him. He has followed the direction of God. He's had the blessing of God upon him. He's done the right thing at the right time, in the right way, with the right attitude. And he still has opposition. Okay? So be encouraged by that, that he's done everything right. I, I don't see any, any flaw in this whole project that we can blame some kind of failure or misstep on Nehemiah. He's done everything right. He, he's a tremendous model in, in that sense, uh, especially that he's not a priest, he's not a king, he's not uh, a prophet. He's, he's just a guy. He's just a guy, but he hears God's voice and he obeys. And that is so very wonderful to see. But lots of forms of opposition rise to hinder the work. And yet, the miracle of the rebuilding of the wall at Jerusalem continues to happen. In spite of all that, in spite of all the opposition, and, and you know, I could talk politically now for all the nonsense that's going on against the church without speaking um, about independent or Democrat or Republican, all the opposition in this culture against who we are and what our identity is and what we are about, um, you even, well, there are a lot of things that are moving against us, but in spite of that, churches are flourishing, there are still people being saved and filled and healed and brought into the body of Christ and completely changed, and some of them are in an important position, and some of them are not, um, but we see God's plan continues to roll forward, and it, it's uh, exemplified here in Nehemiah, and uh, is in our life and our situation as well, and I'll come back to that um, thought here in just a few moment, moments, but in the first nine verses, and uh, We've all agreed you're reading ahead, and so we don't have to, uh, to read it publicly. Uh, some places we do. But in the first verse, we see that the victory is in sight. It's almost there. The project is almost complete. And, boy, the, there's no, no excitement uh, like that when you see the light at the end of the, the project and go, man, we're going to, on this shift, on this day, on this... You know, within this week, we're going to finish up this thing and, and uh, walk away from it. In this, in this case, the wall is up, has been rebuilt. Uh, now, the wall at Jerusalem is big. And so they haven't built the entire wall, but they have rebuilt what was damaged and push, pushed over and burned. They've rebuilt the wall and only left uh, is the, uh, in the project are the hanging of the wooden gates. So as the final effort may in the project is being made to finish it up, the opposition makes its final pitch, final effort to stop them. Because, you know, his, he wants to stop what we are doing, and he wants to stop the project that Nehemiah is uh, in charge of. And so verse 2, here comes a, a potential stoppage. And the phrase here is, come, let us meet together. Now, this is from the people who have denigrated and insulted and said horrible things about the people involved, about the materials, about Nehemiah, just all kinds of bad stuff. And suddenly, they want to sit down and, and meet. Um, the meeting place is 19 miles away from Jerusalem. And it's uh, almost to Tel Aviv, where the big airport is. And uh, if you have been there or if you're going, uh, you will ride from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem by motor coach or something. And you will pass by a 10-story tall garbage dump. That's how tall it is now. I mean, they just keep piling it up. And you say to yourself... Oh no, and it is the plane of Ono. Oh <laughs> That's exactly what it is, and and that'll uh, kind of thumbtack that in your memory, and you drive past that place and you, oh man, 
and the plain of Ono is where they propose the meeting. And there are some Jews that are living there, but it's 19 miles is a long ways away. It's a long ways away. And there are popular proposals that come up that are very difficult at times for us to turn down. That if we have an invitation for reconciliation, for mutual understanding, for peaceful coexistence, for unity. Let's have a meeting for unity of all the pastors on Sunday morning. Those are hard to say no to. Even though the people organizing it don't have your best interest in mind at all. And unity is the farthest thing from their mind. They want uh, conformity. They want you to conform to them usually. But Nehemiah is alert. He's aware of these enemies. These are avowed enemies of the project and of the Jews. And they have spoken uh, in such language and they have demonstrated themselves to be enemies, suddenly they want to have a meeting. Hmm. Oh, really? Well, uh, Nehemiah knows there's mischief afoot, to use a Sherlock Holmes phrase. Uh, the game is afoot. Uh, there's harm and probably assassination. See, if they can get Nehemiah away from the city, away from the people, out here, he's not going to show up with a big, you know, uh, goon squad to protect him. He's going to be, you know what I mean? He's going to, they're going to get him 19 miles away from the project. They're going to kill him. Because he knows, they know, we know, if you take the key man out of a project, the project may finish, but it's going to be a lot different than it was before. When you take the key person, and when I say man, I'm including the women. You understand that. The key person in a project away, it's going to alter the way that thing flows. It's going to change things even if you get it done. Uh, who's going to replace Billy Graham? No one. No one will. No one can. <laughs> it was his burden, his call, his ministry, and we honor him and the recorded six million conversions under his ministry. Six million. I've got a ways to go, I'm, but I'm not even trying to catch him. But you, you understand, the, the ministry's changed. Now there's a daughter and there's a son, and they're doing some different things, but the structure and the organization can remain the same, all the staff can stay in place, but when the person that has the vision and the calling is removed, for whatever reason, good or bad, things are going to change, major adjustments are going to be necessary. And so Nehemiah takes it under consideration. He's not insulting when he could be. Uh, he didn't call them what they should be called. He said this in verse 3, I am doing a great work and therefore I cannot meet with you. Now, at first blush, this sounds like a, a statement from an ego that's out of control. You know what I mean? Hey, I'm doing a great work here. I can't meet with you. Uh, yeah. But this is not. See, uh, the pop psychologist today would coach us to say, look, I'm somebody great. Because, and, and would encourage you to believe that about yourself. Even if you're not. You see, one of the big tragedies, maybe a casualty, I should call it, is that people have rejected in, in cultural uh, society uh, guilt feelings. Well, I'm going to reject that guilt feeling. Well, but you're guilty. <laughs> Those guilt feelings are good when you are guilty. Did somebody say something? Oh, okay. Uh, you know, those are warning signs. Uh, of either your conscience or the Holy Spirit, um, or how about inferiority feelings? Well, I don't know, I'm not going to have those. Well, maybe you are inferior. But think of this, if you are substantially inferior and you believe yourself to be superior, you got a real problem. Are you with me? You know, if we will value ourselves, Paul recommended this, 
uh, think of yourselves as you ought, that determine the value you are and recognize you're not here, you're not here, you're here. And don't, don't monkey with it. Don't, oh, well, you know, I'm really nobody. I don't have anything good to say. And I'm not, you know, the second coming either. I'm somewhere in between. And so Nehemiah is not saying, I'm somebody great. Why are you talking to me? He's saying, look, what I'm doing is great. And, and I want, and I hope that you would adopt this in your own um, large attitude about this church. You're doing something great here. You may be doing a little bit. You may be doing a lot. You may be giving a little. You may be giving a lot. You may be working a little. But the, the composite of everyone together, you're, you're accomplishing something that other people would like to do or like to have or like to accomplish. And it, it separates the ego from the work. We're doing something great here Together. Together. And I hope that you will buy into that, not for my benefit, but for your own, that this is not some casual little thing. I was asked by um, another, from another church, a man from another church this week, uh, what is that church that you're speaking at? And I explained as much as I knew how, and he's, hmm, because you're different. You're, you're not denominational oriented. You're, you're not trying to um, do a lot of other things. You're, you're trying to put something together under the burden and vision that Pastor Jonathan has. And it's coming together. Uh, not at warp speed, but it's coming together. And, and I commend you for that. Um, there, there is something negative that happens for us when we start something and it, we accomplish too much too soon. That's not a good thing. We tend to relax and, and assume that this is easy. But when it's over a long term, it takes a lot of work and a lot of money and a lot of influence, you appreciate what's in it and you strive to preserve what God has put together. And he's done some things here. And, and, and he's going on. We're, we're still laying the foundation, I believe, uh, for tremendous things in the future. But I'm doing a great work. Um, now you can tell by this time, I'm, I'm a Nehemiah fan. I like this man. I, and I, I will defer to defending him if there's some question along the way. Um, the ministry that we have, the calling that God has upon your life, doesn't say that you're so great, but what you're doing is great. Uh, I was talking with Shane earlier uh, uh, before we started, and I, I don't know the exact number, but I've probably given this series in multiple countries um, maybe a hundred times. And I've seen different things happen from this material whether it's in a Bible college or a university or a big church or a little church or just to the leadership, all, all kinds of different places where I've given this because the application of building a wall and following God's burden and vision uh, are, are widely applicable. I mean, there's just so many places. Even Pastor Denny mentioned the other day as we visited with him, he smiled and he said, so many applications. Of, uh, of the first few chapters uh, in this task. And we know that all tasks are not magnificent. But all tasks can be done magnificently. Amen. You can do a good job at whatever it is. You can be the best, world's best, table and chair mover. And we appreciate those of you that do that. And most of them are, are the guys, but I don't want to exclude any of the, the women because I know that happens as well. Uh, to rearrange this, this room, to set it up for another function, another service, another situation. Um, do your job magnificently. Uh, you, you can, from whether it's the top or the bottom, anywhere in between, 
And Nehemiah also demonstrates for us that uh, the work of God, whatever that may be, see, his, uh, however you may define that kind of a term, the work of God, hmm, that can have different uh, applications. For Nehemiah, it's moving rocks. It's supervising a construction crew. See, he, there's no record that he, uh, so far, we're, we're getting to it, that he had a congregational meeting or they sang one song. Do you think he prayed? Oh, he prayed all the time. But he's, he, that's not his project. His project, we got to get this wall built and we got to get it built now because, you know, the more time that it takes, the more opposition we're going to have. This is his work of God. And it becomes a very high priority in his life. Um, and I hope that you will carefully consider whatever ministry, whatever calling, whatever place there is in this church for your activity and your ministry to occur to have a high level of priority. Not just for the church's benefit, but for your benefit as well. It will benefit you to put a high priority on something outside yourself, something other than your own self-interest and, and self-preservation. You're, you're doing something uh, because of your belief, because of your faith, at the direction of God, and with no real promise of any reward. Nobody here has been overpaid, have they? And probably not going to happen. Well, that, that's not needed. But there's going to be something that is um, giving the exhibition of your Christian character in your ministry. If you, if you watch the, the little ones, if you fix food in the uh, pantry there, if you sweep, if you clean, there's an extension of what God is doing in you, in your character, in the building of who you are. Um, and you will be promoted if you are faithful. And that is the one singular key for promotion, faithfulness. God cannot, will not, has not giving, given you the ability to be faithful. You have to decide that yourself. Once you have decided it, he will provide the talent and the gifting and the opportunity for those gifts to be expanded and to uh, receive, the others to receive from your ministry. But you have to bring faithfulness to the table. You have to make the decision. Well, we'll just call for the elders and get a big jug of oil and that's not the way that works. And God will just make me faithful. No, he won't. <laughs> you have to decide, I am going to be involved in this. I'm going to hear the voice of God. I'm going to obey and uh, follow godly leadership. So I'll ask you this rhetorical question. What does it take to stop you? An insult? An ugly look? A bad comment? Um, a perceived slight? Um, Matthew 24 lists a lot of things that are going to happen during the end time, uh, according to Jesus. And uh, he's been right so far. You get my sarcasm, I'm sure. And one of the things he says in chapter 24 is, many, in the, in the end times, many will be offended. H have you seen in your whole lifetime, in the last five years, how many people get offended over nothing? A perceived offense. Well, I didn't like the way you said that. I know what you meant. So no, that's not what I meant. No, I know what you meant. How, how do you know that? <laughs> Are you with me? People that have told, maybe not you, but told me what I meant when I said something. I said, no, I didn't mean that. Yes, you did. And I'm offended. Well, if you choose to be offended, you're going to find a lot of things that will stir your nest up, I can tell you. But to go to the ultimate, what does it take to stop you 
in your obedience to God, in your service to God, in, uh, you know, people, people get mad at the pastor. Or they, they don't agree with something in Scripture, and you know who's right. If you and God disagree, who's right about this? <laughs> Uh, because that's, that comes into question. Well, I, I, I might be right. I might care more and have more compassion for this kind of a situation than God seems to. Be very careful, friend, thinking you're more caring, more compassionate, more loving than Jesus Christ himself who gave his life for those sorry people. Hello, are you with me? You don't have more compassion than God does. No matter how much you think. For any lame situation. Whether it's their fault for being in. Well you understand. What does it take to stop you? One, one man put it this way. You can tell the size of a person. By the size of the rock in the road. That stops them. Big rocks might stop a big person. Little rocks stop little people. Hello. <laughs> how big of a rock does it take in your path? How much of a difficulty, um, whether it's a personal relationship, somebody at church you can't stand? And uh, Scripture says you have to love them, but you don't have to like them. Are you with me on that distinction? You don't have to like everybody, and you don't have to be liked by everybody. You don't have to be a people pleaser. You do have to love them, and if you will pray for them in love, uh, your tolerance for them will be a little bit better. But there could be somebody in church you just don't like to be around. It happens. It happens. Don't let that stop you. Don't let that stop your dedication your calling to what God has done in your life. In verse 4, Nehemiah says, they were persistent. And so I was persistent. <laughs> They're in opposition, having opposition uh, to what go is going on. So he said, I'll just be persistent back to you. How about that? And then verses 5 through 7, uh, they begin to use scare tactics and false accusations. Now, you've seen enough historical movies, I'm sure, or dramas. When somebody sends a letter of communication, usually they fold it or roll it. They put some wax on, on the seam and put the signet ring down into the wax. And then whoever receives that communication knows whether it's been broken open or not. You know whether it's been tampered with. Well, here's a letter that is written and sent unsealed nobody put their mark on it nobody put wax on it why would you send a letter unsealed exactly you want everybody to read it here read this and pass it on and nobody knows that everybody's read it and so what's been put in that letter bad things accusing Nehemiah um, about uh, some very important things. The contents are unsealed so that everybody knows about it. So it is everybody's business. You figured it out exactly. In this letter, and of course nobody signed it, which is another problem. I know a pastor in South America who keeps a, a, a notebook in his desk. And when somebody, a member comes in, and he's a fairly important guy, um, they have a complaint against another member. And first thing he does is pull out that notebook. He says, well, now, if you will write down what they did and what they said and what you think about it and then sign your name to it, then I'll work on it. That notebook, after 40-some years of ministry, is still blank. And when they do that, then he jumps their case and he says, now look, you, you won't stand by in writing what you've just said, but what you've done is use my ear as a garbage can for your complaints, and I don't appreciate that, don't ever do it again. 
Have you had people use your ear for a garbage can? Uh-huh. Maybe you could uh, take some courage from, from the pastor and uh, say, knock that off. So nobody has signed the letter. They just accused Nehemiah, of, well, of three major things. First, uh, they accused him of treason against the king. Well, that's easy to do because this thing has turned political, you understand. This is, and we understand the realities of what's going on even in our culture and the politics of the spin, the manipulation. You know, they're going to they're gonna accuse somebody. We'll see how much they react. And then it, 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 it's messy, isn't it? So the, he's accused of treason. Well, he's got permission from God first and from the king second to do everything he's done. So what are they doing? They're accusing his intentions. And so the second thing was uh, the accusation of uh, personal ambitions. Uh, you see, he's already governor of Judah, but to be king of Judah. Well, that's real easy to read ambition into other people's action, isn't it? He, he just wants to be, you know, the sectional president. He wants to be denominational presbyter. He wants to be the superintendent of... Oh, come on. Well, maybe there are some that do, but it's not everyone in every case. Isn't she sweet? <laughs> and the baby is too. <laughs> so it's easy to accuse Nehemiah of having aspirations, political aspirations. I assure you, he does not. I know the rest of the story. And if you've read the rest of the book, it, he doesn't. He doesn't want to be king. He just wants to get this job done. The third thing that we notice is that he has been accused of hiring prophets and bribing prophets to speak. Now, that existed at this time. That practice of bribing prophets happened in Old Testament times. It's a little more subtle today. It's not quite as easy to determine. But that practice has not stopped because it works. There are still prophets that can be hired. Don't be one of them. Mm -hmm. Don't be one of them that would lend your uh, effect, your voice, your influence for any kind of favorable uh, condition or remuneration whatsoever. Um, and, and it's sad that there's one. Are you with me? And, and I'm not going to state a broadside about prophets and that office. Um, Paul said, do not despise prophecy. It's the only function of uh, the spiritual gifts that he gives that warning to. Do not despise prophecy. So we obey, we, we, we don't, but we keep our eyes open. Nehemiah, as we've stated, he's not a priest, he's not a king, he's not a prophet, but this man has some perception that's, that I'm jealous of. He sees through some stuff, um, not just because of his experience and a man of the world, he has some spiritual activity going on and he has a calm and a firm response to these major accusations. I mean, can you imagine what the normal person would do if you were accused of these things in your situation? Why, you know, you'd remember some, some names to call that you haven't said in a while. But they're back in there, you know. They could come up. You could question, you know, the uh, parentage of the people making the accusation. That's a nice way to put it, isn't it? You're, you said, my mama what? <laughs> you know. He doesn't. He says, none of that is true. You've just made it up from your imagination. And he's done with them. He's done with them. There's no arguing. There's no what if. There's no or else. It, that's just not true. Walk away. Is he upset? Doesn't seem to be. 
He probably expected this kind of stuff. And he knew what to say. Don't get mad. Don't, you know, Shakespeare wrote, Methinks thou protesteth too much. You know, if you over-protest, maybe we've, we've hit a spark there. Maybe we've touched a nerve and there's something going on. Just calm down and just, yeah, that's not true. You just made it up and go on about your work. So in verse 9, uh, are you becoming weak from the work? Ask God for the strength that you need. Is it that simple? Yes, it really is. You're doing God's work. Why wouldn't he give you the strength to do what you need? And it's when we ask him for strength to do stuff we dreamed up and not, <laughs> you know, I'm off here on my own doing my own project and I ask for God's blessing, God's favor, and God's help. And he goes, I don't think so. Why don't you try doing my stuff? Why don't you try obedience for a while and I'll give you a lot of strength to obey, and that'll explain some things um, for you. In, in the next section, verses 10 through 14, we, we have approached now the spiritual discernment, and we see that Nehemiah certainly is a man discerning, able to discern. That isn't a bad thing. I, I guess I gave a, a trick question one day to a, a racially mixed audience, and I said, well, how, how many think that discrimination is wrong? Well, I'm telling you, some hands went up. And I said, are you sure? I said, didn't you discriminate when you chose the one that you married? You discriminated against the other ones. There were, there were lots of candidates, weren't there? Well, I think there were. If you found some glass, some shattered glass on the edge of your lunch plate today and you put that over to the side and decided not to eat that even though it was served to you. That's discrimination. <laughs> because discrimination is determ making a determination. That's all. Making it. Now, if you put racial in front of that word, that's a whole different matter. But just discrimination, we, we discriminate all the time. Why, that's why we have Fords and Chevys. That's why uh, Rick, right, rode a bicycle tonight. He, he decided, this is what I'm going to do. Okay. You see, we make choices, we make decisions based upon what we see, but then the Holy Spirit speaks to us and gives us things to know that we didn't read. There's a knowledge that comes from God through the ministry of, of his spirit to help you make decisions and to discriminate properly. You discriminate right from wrong. I'll just put it very simply. You discriminate right from wrong and you push aside the wrong. Hello? Here we have a prophet coming. His name is Shemaiah. And apparently he's been paid by the opposition. I say apparently, it doesn't say so, but by what he does. He, uh, he's hiding. Okay? Because he, he, he's projecting um, that he's in danger. And he comes to Nehemiah and expresses his belief that both he and Nehemiah are in grave danger. He attempts to scare Nehemiah. He attempts to manipulate Nehemiah. He says, let us run and hide together. You see, there's some threats out there. The neighbors are threatening. Sanballat, Tobiah, and some others. They're threatening the Jews and specifically Nehemiah. Okay, so where shall we run, sir? And he said, there's a place, there's a special place in the temple where only the priests are allowed to go. We can run and hide there and no one will ever think to look there to find us. Is that true? That's absolutely true. Absolutely. Because only the priesthood was allowed the privilege of, of access to that area. 
And Shemaiah says, come run with me because we're in danger and you, you can hide with me. Are you kidding? Are you really kidding? Here's the response in verse 11. Should the leader run and hide because of a rumor or a threat? What will this do to the morale of the people working on the crew? When the leader, when there's a threat that comes down and the leadership goes and hides. And then, uh, you know, is this the example that I want to set for all the people faithfully working on the wall who are in danger? Well, we're all in danger. We're just going to accept that. There are some crazy people, unhinged people that don't want this church to exist. I'm not kidding you. Now, I'm not, I don't know personally. I just know there are some folks out there. Nehemiah says, is this the reputation that I want? That when, when the opposition makes a threat, I'm going to go into hiding? And if I start running now, where do I stop? That's a good thing to, to assess early on in your flight. Where are you going to stop? Or are you going to submit to running the rest of your life? To threats or perception of threat. Even if it just seems like it's threatening. And then here's, here's a bottom line that's good. Should I break the law of God? Because that's what he's going to do if he goes into the, to the place where the, the, only the priesthood is allowed. Should I break the law of God simply and merely for self-preservation? I've been told not to go back to Pakistan for Christian meetings. Pakistan is 97% Muslim. And they're radical, let me tell you. It is the Islamic uh, Republic of Pakistan. 97%. I mean, we've had the United Nations pull uh, security for our meetings, and we've had screen, uh, metal detectors at the door, and all kinds of stuff over there. It's quite exciting. But some Americans have told me, oh, don't go back over there. Why not? Well, you might die. Really? <laughs> Is that all? I'm supposed to disobey the direction of God and hide in a bed somewhere and think that I'm safe all when I cover up my head? That's the most dangerous place in the world if God has told you, like he told Jonah, go here and you go hide somewhere. You're in a dangerous place in hiding, let me tell you, because that is a disobedient state. Are, are you with me? A lot of people die in bed too, and I don't, I, don't, I don't let that worry me too much. So here's Nehemiah. You know, we, we tell our children, young people, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. Obey your parents, don't have sex before uh, marriage, a lot of other moral and ethical things. Why do we tell them that? Well, it could hurt your career. That's a bad answer. Well, you know, you might embarrass the church family if that becomes known. It might embarrass your family in the community. Those are bad answers. Those are, those are wor the worst answers. The good answer is we want to be disciples of Jesus Christ that walk in obedience that springs from a love of God, his scripture, his church, the body of Christ, and we want God's will to be done in our life and accomplished, the blessing to come. Hello? It could hurt your career. Please. There's some, or here's, here's the worst one that I think, you know, when some kids come to the dad with a spiritual question and say, go ask your mother. Because she takes care of all the spiritual business of the household. That's lame. Let me tell you, that is lame. There, there's a time for complete answers to young people, and there's a time for age-appropriate answers. You with me? You know, Daddy, where does this come from? There's a time to answer that in complete detail, and it isn't at three or four or five. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not a, 
a child raiser, so I'm, I'm not telling you that. But we make moral decisions, ethical decisions, with eternity in view, not next week. Not short term. It might get you out of a jam. It might get you past something this week. But we make decisions with eternity in view. Seeing what the will of God for our lifetime is. And if this fits into that. So here's another. We're going we're to deal with some other things uh, later. But here's in, in verse 12. Um, here's a prophecy that comes to Nehemiah. That is labeled for him. But it's not. It seems to be for Nehemiah. It's tailored for him. But it's not for him. Men and women need the discernment of the Holy Spirit active in their life. Not just the pastor. Not just the teacher. Not just the prophet. Not just every single one of us. Every single person needs more discernment in in the spiritual realm than we have. And I'm in that group. I need more than I have. Uh, God revealed to Nehemiah, who is a discerning man, that the man talking to him was a hired prophet and he would prophesy to, for the pleasure of the highest bidder. I, I don't know that I would ever trust a man again if I learned that he would prophesy for money. He might be redeemed, he might be restored, he might repent... And I go, well, yeah, but I'm going to be careful. Uh, I heard one of the senators use this phrase in an interview this last week. He said, I believe love is the answer, but I do own a gun. (laughs) 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 So, uh, Nehemiah discerns. This man is prophesying to me, not in a big congregation. It could be meant for someone else. He is prophesying to me, for me, and it's, I'm the only one here. And he's saying, no, that's not for me. That's not a proper, and he doesn't go into a lot of detail. He doesn't call the guy names. He doesn't question his heritage. He doesn't rake him over the coals. He just says, no, that's not for me. That, I, I've had lots of stuff said over me, some of it good, some of it not. Some of it came to pass, some of it didn't. And I don't know if you eat fish or not, but when you, when you eat fish, you drag the bones out and leave them and forget them, and you eat the good part. In dealing with people who may or may not have a spiritual gift, take the good part and drag the bones away and forget them. Just forget them. Don't ever report on it. Just forget them. I don't need more detail on that, do I? You understand exactly what I'm saying. So the enemy's objective, and of course Jesus taught this, is to rob, to kill, and to destroy. And that is an interesting study in and of itself in the sequence of those three things. To rob, to kill, and destroy. He's trying to do it here. He's trying to destroy the effect of Nehemiah, the leadership of Nehemiah, he doesn't want the project to be completed because it gives glory and honor to God, doesn't it? And the people will be encouraged. People will have respect. And all all kinds of good things will happen when they hang that last wooden gate and go, it's done. It's done. Well, that's what is reported in the next few verses, 15 through 19, the wall is finished. The rebuilding of the wall and this project has taken 52 days. 52 days. That's not very long for a massive construction project to happen. God made it happen. He made them efficient and the project is accomplished even though the enemy has um, made inroads by alliances and coalitions with the enemy. There have been disobedient marriages that have disrupted the community. There are wrong business 
uh, arrangements that the, the brothers have practiced. And we talked a little bit about that last week, about um, foreclosing on properties, uh, charging interest to brothers. Now we're talking about under the Mosaic law to those that were in the household of faith. Okay? And in their case, you can charge Gentiles interest and it's okay. Are you with me? And furthermore, we're not living under the law of Moses today. So interest is all right to a certain point. To a certain point. Well, I believe the takeaway on this is that uh, God gave Nehemiah a huge job. A big, big project and then caused the supplies to come on board, the crew to come on board, and gave him the leadership on how to coordinate everything that happened. There's no record that Nehemiah picked up one stone in the whole project. The people did the work. Are you with me? He was there. He's the first one there and the last one to leave. You know, he's got the key to the door. Uh, the analogy is here. Uh, but the people did the work. And the takeaway is, whatever God has given to you to do, and it's different than what he's given to me, or to Bootsy, or to Pastor, you can do it. You can do what God has given you. Now, if you've got personal aspirations that are wild and crazy, maybe, maybe you'll get that done, maybe you won't. But if God has assigned something to you or prompted something to your heart, given you a job to do, given you a project, you can do it. He will intervene. He will supply. He will empower. He will direct because it's his project. You know, along the way, it's, it's almost comical if you step back and watch people who are doing what God has told them to do and then they beg for his blessing. I have a different perspective on that. that if, you're, if you're in obedience to God, he has obligated himself to make his jobs successful. He has obligated himself to supply your need. Uh, think how crazy it is, how illogical it is to beg God to help you do what he wants you to do. He's going to help you. He, he's welded himself, his will to and his purpose in your life and you thank him for it before you see it because he will supply, he will provide. He is our provision. He promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, I am your provision. I'm also your provider. And those are two very completely different things. I will be your provision. Now just go and do what I tell you to do. Boy, just it, it'll save you a lot of prayer of asking for stuff. Just determine you're doing what God has directed you to do, not somebody else, including yourself. Just because you thought it up doesn't mean it's of God. I, I had to deal with a group in Alaska for a while and uh, they were young in um, Holy Spirit matters, and they believed and taught that every dream you have is Holy Spirit inspired. Every thought you have as a redeemed person is from God. And they were doing wacky stuff. Not wrong, just wacky. So not every dream you have is prophetic or directive. Sometimes it's just too many onions on the pizza. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the pizza uh, revelation that comes, pepperoni, uh, hang on here. Not everything that comes in your head is from the Holy Spirit. Some of it is, but you have got to lean on God for discernment to d make that determination. And then, also, you have to rule against yourself. Because I know what I like. See, I've never been directed to go eat a hot fudge sundae with extra almonds on it. Brahms has a pretty good one. That's what I like. 
So if I pretend like I've heard the word from the cloud to go have a hot fudge Sunday, no, no, that's just me. <laughs> so you have to separate what you want and what you desire from what God wants. And often God will tell you things to do that you really don't want to do. You really won't like to do it. Mm -hmm. But separate what you want from what God wants and in the long run it'll, it'll pay you off. We know that within the church and within the congregation of Nehemiah, the reports are going to be glorious. The wall is finished. God has done his job. Nehemiah has, has been a trooper. I'm telling you, capital T. He's, he has been amazing in what has been accomplished. And we, we understand that. When within the ranks, within this, this group that's here tonight, faithful on Wednesday, uh, Sunday night, uh, we know you're going to recognize the goodness of God, the accomplishment of God. We're going to all join together in praise and worship that God did this, even though it was our hands that applied it. God did the, these things, and we give him credit for that. But it, it's always good, and in this case, we have some, uh, well, the, the prosecuting attorney would call it corroboration. What does the enemy say? What do the people outside the church say? Wouldn't it be interesting to know? In this case, Nehemiah 6.16 says, the people outside the wall said, the work is of God. Now, how did they get so much discernment? <laughs> I don't know, but they recognize when God is working. A lot of, a lot of people outside the fellowship recognize when God is working. And don't discount that completely. He may be bringing them in. He may be warming them to the invitation um, to be a part of this work or someone else's. Uh, this, this situation is referred to in Psalm 126, specifically verse 2. And this reports also those that are outside the wall as they view Nehemiah and the completed wall and the, now the, the gates are hung. And the phrase from that verse says this, the Lord has done great things for them. Wouldn't that be great if the Miami City Council said something like that about you? The Lord has done great things for them. Now, we're going to agree. We're going to say, yeah, the Lord has done great things for us. But it's great reinforcement when the enemy recognizes it. The enemy says, they've been blessed. God's intervened. He has been involved here. He's brought Nehemiah. He's brought the crew together. He's brought the supplies. What a plan. What a plan. I think God gets a lot of credit for being love. He gets a lot of credit for being powerful. But he doesn't get very much credit for being smart. God is smart. And he had this project figured out long ago before they even tore the wall down. He knew how it was going to come back. He had it figured out. The right people, the right supplies, the right timing, the right opposition. You know, to see if you're serious about this. God is smart. And if we will follow his plan, in this case, Nehemiah looks like a genius. Just on the, on the peer level, as we're standing on the ground in Jerusalem, Nehemiah, you are a genius. But he knows where it all came from. And we do too. But you know, he'll, he'll let you look like a genius if you'll give him the credit. Yeah, just be obedient. That's right. Just be obedient. And if the credit comes in, say, all glory goes to God. I, I just did what he, I just was just obedient. I just did what God told me to do. And you will look like a genius. And it's okay if you don't take the credit. 
you know, don't get the big head and say, well, you know, I built this wall. No, God built it and used me. Uh, we have kind of an independent streak in our culture. People don't want to be used. You know what I mean? But yet God wants to use us. And we have to make some kind of ego adjustment to let him use us in ministry. We want to be used by God. We don't want to be misused by people. I understand that and I agree. But we can put up such a wall of defense against being used that we resist God moving on our heart to join in with the crew of Nehemiah to get something done. I, I want to be used, not by you, but by him. Are you with me? This is not personal. I want him to use me, use my life, my influence, my ministry for his glory, for his benefit, for the furtherance of the gospel, for the expansion of his kingdom, however he determines. Where and what? He'll let us know. He'll let us know where it is. And, uh, you know, we have to kind of dial that in. It, it, and, and kind of back off a little bit and say, I, I would like for God to use me. I would like for, for people to be benefited with what I do. I would like for your destiny, your future, your eternity to be altered because of me. There's a big responsibility that goes with that. Because once you, once you commit to that, boy, he just pours in the power. He pours in the abilities. He opens the doors of opportunity. And you begin to affect people. And then, of course, the guard is, don't take credit. God's doing this work. And he's using you, hand in glove, to accomplish what he wants to do. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and I'll close for tonight. Paul is writing to a problematic church, but he gives them just stellar advice here, and it may be more than advice. It may be in the tone of a command. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That there is an accomplishment. There is an objective. There is a goal that God has for this church. I can't tell you what it is. And you may not know what it is. Pastor Jonathan may not know what it is. But there is something out there that God intends for this group that has coalesced together to stay faithful and to build and, and be faithful on, on this path that what you're doing is not in vain. I, uh, I'll tell a little story on my wife. She is uh, an efficiency freak. Totally. I'm telling you, you know, if I'm going to another part of the house, well, you need to take this with you so that you don't waste a trip. And then there's something else over there that you need to be bringing back. Every trip, and sometimes I even forget why I went, you know, because I'm <laughs> dealing with all the, all the periphery stuff. And she said, she's told me, I, I, except for Jesus, I love you more than anything. I said, oh, no, I know better than that. I said, Here, here's Jesus. This is what I've, I've done with her long ago. Here's Jesus. Here's efficiency. And here's me. <laughs> she loves efficiency. She loves it. We can count on doing what God has gifted us to do. 
That's internal gifting with door of opportunity. And you've got to have both of those. I, 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 just as an aside, I have friends that know their gift, and they can't find any open doors. I have friends who have lots of open doors, and they don't know what their gift is. You've got to have both of those. That, that's a dynamic coupling. You've got to know your gift, and then you've got to look properly for the door of opportunity to exercise that gift. It goes together. So you can be assured as you have joined together in God's purpose for New Beginnings Life, there is a purpose that's not in vain. This isn't just being efficient for efficiency's sake. There is something that he wants to accomplish in the long term in this place and with you as a group. So with that word of encouragement, I'm going to close tonight. And uh, we've got two sessions left, uh, chapter 7, and then we'll touch on the first part of chapter 8, two weeks from tonight. And uh, you're going to hear something you've never heard before. We have promised to entertain your questions. Does anybody have a question about tonight's material specifically? Say again. What do you think Nehemiah felt? What he felt? He, I think he's exhilarated. I, I think he just, spiritually and emotionally, just over the top. That look what God has done, and he allowed us to do it. Or to be a part of it. We, God's going to build a wall. But it's our privilege to be a part of that process. So, uh, I don't think he's personally prideful. I think he's way past that in his spiritual maturity. But I think he is elated that the project is completed. And, you know, he can just look over at San Ballot and Tobiah and go, uh-huh. <laughs> See what God has done. And we were privileged to be a part of it. And, and that's truly a, the proper attitude. We're just, we're just part of this. But... You know, if God wanted to get things done efficiently and completely, on time and under budget, he'd just do it himself. He wouldn't include any human in <clears throat> excuse me, instrumentality whatsoever. He wouldn't include any humans because we slow it down. We make it more expensive. Uh, we make it the project later than the deadline. Uh, you know what I'm saying. We don't, we don't help God do it better. He allows us in on his project at all. He wants to use men and women. He wants to. He chooses to. And he empowers us if we will obey Back to Larry's analysis, if you just be obedient, you'll have all the power and all the opportunity and all the ability that you can imagine. You won't even be able to go to sleep some nights because you, you've got to get stuff done. I mean, he'll, he'll be on you, but he's going to do it, but he chooses to use men and women. I don't understand it, but... It's an accommodation on his part, but he knows we are changed in the process. When divine things happen through you, whether it's a word of counsel, a prayer for healing or the miraculous, uh, if it's a lesson or a sermon or a song, and somebody's life is changed. All I did was just sing the song. I, didn't, I don't have the power to change your life. But God does while I'm up here making noise. So, anyone else? Question? more of a statement, I think, than a question. But, you know, I think you were very accurate in saying that he and I walked through this process perfectly. Yeah. I mean, there was very little that he did wrong. Yeah. I mean, 
he, he functioned as a very mature, spiritually mature man. And what you're saying, I think, is true, that God prepares us through different schools. And some of them are difficult to bring us to a mature place for a great project. Because this didn't happen early on. This happened later in his life. And yeah, and, and sometimes we'll lose sight. Um, I'm encouraged whenever I study or read about the life of Joseph. Uh, Joseph with a coat of many colors. He got a real cool jacket and then everything went downhill. And everything that happened to Joseph was bad. He doesn't want to be ruler over Egypt, but God is saving his countrymen and his family from starvation by the sacrifice of Joseph's life. All kinds of bad things that happen. Mrs. Potiphar, the prison, being disrespected, maybe the worst for three years, being forgotten. Oh, that really comes to my house. I'm telling you, uh, like me or don't like me, I hate it if you forget me. <laughs> I don't know who that guy was. I hate that part. Are you with me? I'd, I'd rather you not like me and remember me than to just forget about me. And Joseph was forgotten in prison and stayed true to God, faithful to God's promises, and submitted to the hard stuff. And uh, there's a... Uh, there's a word we have in English, and uh, it comes up in, in conversation from time to time. Uh, C-R-U-X is the word in Latin for cross. And there is a term called excruciating pain. And in the middle of that word is C-R-U-X. And it is specifically the pain of crucifixion. And so we have a little bit of fun with it that, you know, I've got a headache and the pain is just excruciating. No, it isn't. <laughs> no, it's not. You are not experiencing, you never have experienced excruciating pain. Never. And I hope you never do. <laughs> because it is the pain of being crucified. It's, it's bad. <laughs> So whatever you have had uh, may be severe. Uh, you may have a life like Joseph that everything seems to be against you, but it's not. Uh, God is fashioning something great in his life, and I believe in yours. He's fashioning something great. He says, well, man, I'm over 35. You better hurry up. I'm going to be old soon. Uh, he'll take his time, and he'll mold you to be the person that he wants for the job that he has in mind. And uh, I've, I've, I've met a lot of people that worked their uh, secular job, retired at age 55 or 60, and then went to the mission field. They had a, uh, a retirement fund. They had an income. They didn't have to raise their, their income as a missionary. And so now they get to do what they really want to do. And they love it. They love it. Uh, and they've, they've gone to the mission field at age 56 or 66 and begun a new career, in effect. And God has provided for them in such a miraculous way. So um, you, you don't know what God has in mind for you. But what he has in mind for every individual that will trust him through the difficult times and be faithful is a tremendous thing. The Lord has done great things for them. And I, I, want, I want your community and your family to say that about you at some point. Whether they're a believer or whether they're not, the Lord has done great things for you. And we see that. Anybody else with a question or a comment? All right, Pastor Jonathan, please come. Clean up the mess. <laughs>